going to talk about food. Feeding the world is an incredibly complex task, a complex system. And actually, I often hear it referred to as being broken. And I can understand that because, you know, on the one hand, we still have 800 million people undernourished. And on the other hand, we have 1.2 billion who are obese. And so obese that they actually get disease from that. So um, I can understand that it's being referred to as broken. But it's even worse. You have seen this morning that there are, you know, we have to think about phosphorus cycles, about nitrogen cycles. We have to think about um, all sorts of cycles. We have to think about climate change, how that's going to affect our food production. And so it's better if we build in as many resilience as we can. So we have to basically recruit every option that we have to improve our food system and to remove um, inefficiencies. So in um, 2050, we need to feed 9 billion people. And it's not only 9 billion people, it's 9 billion people with increasingly decadent appetites, right, for really expensive parts of our um, food. Um, so we have a choice to make. Um, this is, you know, a braai uh, that you all know much better than I do. Um, and this is a wonderful, it's a wonderful system. It's a wonderful opportunity to socialize, um, to be, you know, interacting with people. And it's, it's also nice because if you don't have anything to say for the moment, you can still eat. Um, and it's a, one of our last kind of excuses to get together in a, in a digital world. This is how um, Silicon Valley looks at food. Um, this is completely digitized. This is all the nutrients that you want to have, all the minerals, vitamins, uh, sugars, amino acids, every component that you need to build your uh, body and to maintain your body. And you can do this, you can drink these bottles, they come in four flavors, the luxury of it. Um, and you can do this while still uh, tapping on your computer and not having to socialize and not having to interact with, with anybody and not having to interrupt your work. Now, they thought that was a, bit, a little bit extreme, so they thought about sort of a social um, correlate of this particular food, but it's still, uh, I can, I assume you agree with me, still not very, very appetizing. So the, the, the problem is, my, my problem is that I love meat. And meat is, is one of those very resource-intense parts of our food. A lot of resources go into producing meat to such an extent that we're currently using 70% of all our arable land to produce meat. Not only beef, but also chicken and pork and lamb and what have you. And the FAO has predicted that in 2050, our meat consumption will increase by 70%. That's a very simple math. That's not going to happen with the current production system. In addition to that, and in some countries, uh, these discussions are much more widely held than in others, uh, we have come to realize also by the report of the FAO that livestock contribute somewhere between 50 and 20% of all greenhouse gases. So again, with the Paris uh, sort of agreements in mind, we have to do something about the livestock industry if we want to uh, reach those uh, milestones. Another very rare resource, water. It takes 15,000 liters of fresh water for one kilogram of beef. So why is that? Why is this such a resource intense material? Well, it's very simple. It's because a cow especially a cow, is a very inefficient animal. If you were today design a protein production system to feed people, you would never ever come up with a cow, right? <laughs> it's, increasing, it, it's incredibly inefficient. For every, for every 100 grams of meat that you get out of a cow, you have to feed it at least 800 grams of feed. The feed industry is much more bigger than the um, livestock industry. You see, for pork, it's better. For chicken, it's better. For fish, it's the best. It's more or less like plants. Now, I'm looking at this at a global level, right? So globally, meat production is a problem. And I'm here in Africa, and I realize that in, in certain areas where it's very low intensity, uh, this could be a very good commodity to have, um, and actually a very sensible food system. 
But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the global part, because this is what it, in some areas of the world, looks like. This is a feedstock, feedlot and you actually cannot see the individual animals because they are so uh, densely populated. But this is the, the current sort of high-intensity farming in some areas of the world. So what can we do? We can all become uh, vegetarian. And there's nothing wrong with being vegetarian. It's completely healthy. We don't need animal proteins. We just don't. Um, there are two billion unvoluntary vegetarians on this planet, and they lead happy lives, they are procreative, they are productive, no problem. The fact is that most have not, most are not. So while I'm having this national symbol on the screen, I'm going to ask you, who of you is vegetarian? Right, it's less than 5%. Now, now this, is the, so this is the really um, uh, ugly question. Who of you knew about these issues with livestock, meat production, before I told you? Right. Have you looked across the room? Um, so, and actually, I, I should have, um, mind you, when I asked vegetarian, I didn't raise my hand either. I'm not a vegetarian, I love meat. And so I'm, I, and I should really become vegetarian. But it's hard to do. It's really, really hard to do. So <clears throat> what else can you do? Oh, by the way, globally, the trend is going the com complete reverse. As I mentioned, 70% more uh, meat consumption in 2050. That's not because we're going to 9 billion people. You have done this calculation. It's because people start to eat more meat when they become wealthy. So this is the human trophic level, it's where we are in the food chain, it's one for a plant, it's two for an animal that eats plants, and it's three for an animal that eats animals that eats plants. Um, and we are roughly at 2.35. Well, here in South Africa, you might be a little bit higher, but not that much. Um, and you see the lower curve is where India and China gradually are sort of creeping up to that level. So, and, and because that, that human trophic level is linearly related to the gross domestic product of a country. So in other words, as soon as number of middle class incomes rise, people start to eat meat. And that's where that 70% increase is coming from. So what else can you do? In, in 2004, I met this uh, guy. He was an 86 year old guy, Willem van Aelen. Um, and he was very obsessed about using medical technology to create food. And he kind of assembled a group of scientists among me to uh, get a grant from the Dutch government um, to start working on this. And the, the, the principle is really simple. You've heard about stem cells. You've heard about synthetic biology. Um, we are having stem cells in pretty much every organ in our body. They're organ specific. And you heard from Audrey, in, in the brain, we don't actually know what they are doing. They're still there. In the heart, we don't know what they are doing. But in our muscle, we know exactly what they are doing. They are producing, they are regenerating muscle. So if you tear a muscle, the stem cells come in, they start to divide, and they start to form muscle tissue, and not scar tissue. It's a wonderful system. So it's a very simple idea. We poke a cow in the butt, get a very small sample of muscle, one centimeter long, one millimeter in diameter, has a couple of hundred of these stem cells and we let them proliferate, because that's what they're good at. Once you take them out, they start to kind of think, oh, we have an injured muscle, we start to proliferate. Um, so they do that kind of spontaneously, and from that small piece of muscle, we can generate thousands of kilos of beef, thereby reducing the number of cows and reducing the environmental impact and the inefficiencies. Now, that's fine. Uh, you have a, a couple of trillion cells, not very protein-rich, definitely not very tasty. So uh, how do you make muscle tissue from it? Well, again, this is what the cells pretty much do by themselves. Uh, the only thing we do is we need to starve them so that they basically start to form a muscle fiber. It's a very primitive muscle fiber, still not a lot of protein in it, still not very edible. Um, so we have to uh, do a little bit more things. And here's where tissue engineering, which is basically the medical technology, comes in. So we put the cells together, you see that on the left side here, we put the cells together in a hybrid between a cooking show, uh, sorry, um, uh, 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 a gel um, in a ring structure so that they start to contract, 
They start to find each other. They start to form a tissue. Um, and because they are around a central column, that contraction actually leads to tension. And if you, if you know how that works in muscle tissue, if you run a marathon, you don't get really thick muscles. You have these really thin legs. Um, so movement itself doesn't do it. You have to go to the gym and start to lift weights to get thick muscles. So it's the tension that actually triggers those cells to produce protein, and that's what we're after. So it takes about three weeks, and after three weeks, um, un when you look under the microscope, you have a ring which you can cut open, and you have a fiber that looks under the microscope exactly the same as a muscle fiber, and it has exactly the same protein content and structure. So what we did in 2013, we made 10,000 of these fibers, and we, we made a hamburger out of it. And we presented it in a um, hybrid between a cooking show and a press conference for 200 journalists in London, which was very unusual for a scientist like me to do. But we wanted to show, here this is the video of the uh, event, uh, we wanted to show to the population, this can be done. The, the technology is there, right here. Um, and by the way, we need to think about how we're going to produce meat in the future if we still want to eat it. Um, that hamburger cost us uh, a quarter million euro. <laughs> so, this never fails to raise a laughter. <laughs> um, but I kind of like that number because it showed that it's not really a product yet, it's kind of a proof of concept. It was eaten by two food critics, uh, Hanni Rutzler from Austria and Josh Schoenwald from Chicago, and they said, oh yeah, this is a hamburger. You know, no big deal. Um, it was a big deal, but you know, it was just still a hamburger. So how do you go from there? How do you go from a quarter million euro hamburger to something that would solve that upcoming problem for uh, meat production? So first of all, of course, you need to make it efficient. You need to scale up production. Uh, you need to make sure that the culture conditions are optimal. Uh, you may need to select your cells very carefully. So we have worked on that for the last five years. Um, and we're ready to uh, scale up production. Now these cells, this is a little bit technical, these cells actually have to grow onto a surface. So in order to be able to scale it up, um, you have to grow them on, on basically little balls, little microcarriers, like the pink ones here. The blue dots are the cells, and the pink sort of spheres are the, the temporary structures on which they are, um, they are growing in a large tank. So the system is uh, relatively simple. You start with a very small number of cells, and then you gradually grow to larger systems, and you end up with a 25,000-liter tank, basically like, like a brewery, like brewing beer, but then harvesting cells. And this tank, uh, we have calculated, you can feed uh, 10,000 Europeans for about a year with meat, and about 5,000 Americans. <laughs> so then, is this going to be sustainable? So in order for it to be sustainable, every component in that meat um, has to be of seemingly unlimited supply. Either because it is, or because you can recycle it. Um, and because we have everything contained in that tank, you potentially can recycle everything. So one of the things traditionally in cell culture, what you do is you add blood to the, to the uh, culture, and then it functions, about 20%. We had to get rid of that. Um, the gel in which those cells are temporarily sitting in that ring structure was still of animal origin and non-replicative. We had to get rid of that. So we worked on that also the last five years. This is a technical slide, kind of boring, but on the left you see that we actually grow these cells in the absence of antibiotics. No antibiotics in this entire process. Um, and on the right-hand side you see that we can actually grow them um, under conditions which doesn't require serum anymore. So we have killed that. And I'm not going to go into detail with that, with that gel, uh, but we have basically replaced that with an algae type of uh, gel. So you can make it sustainable. <coughs> that hamburger that we presented in London uh, didn't have any fat tissue. So the, the tasters actually commented, oh, it is a little bit dry. So uh, currently we're creating fat tissue, and as you can imagine, in the medical field, there's not a lot of need to grow fat tissue. Um, so we had to kind of develop that. Um, and currently, we, all the red stuff that you see here on the left um, is fat tissue. So the next version uh, in uh, a year and a half or so will have fat in it. And then, 
And then something happened that kind of frustrated me. Um, because uh, after that presentation in London, the popular press had these headlines, and they said, uh, yuck, or Frankenstein food. And it was kind of an emotional response that frustrated me, not because it was an emotional response, but I didn't, I didn't quite understand what was behind it. Um, and this was one of my dilemmas. This is a hot dog. Who of you have ever eaten a hot dog? Do you know what's in it? <laughs> or how it's being made? Do you want to know? Shall I tell you? No. This is the typical response that I get. So we are perfectly capable of eating stuff that we don't know what it exactly is or how it's being made. So why is that different for my hamburger, right? That was my dilemma. <laughs> and of course it has to do with safety. We are biologically programmed not to eat stuff that we don't know. And a, and a hot dog, you know, you see your neighbor eat it and he stays alive. Um, <laughs> and you gradually kind of build trust in a product like that. So that takes time, it takes early adopters, it takes time. Well, we have early adopters enough and uh, time, well, hopefully we have time enough. The second is that we want to have the illusion of control over how our food is being produced. Right, so if it's a cow, it's a one and a half million years of evolution, it's checks and balances by nature, it's sort of a natural thing, if you want to call those feedlots natural. Um, and now you're going to convert that into something that's made by people. People are mean, they make mistakes, they are fraudulent. So you kind of lose the sense of control over how that is being produced. And this is actually a theme that runs through the entire two days because we have these technologies, these amazing technologies, but also some fear of, you know, are we certain that we know what that's going to bring and what the risks and balances are? So we developed a story, actually the um, uh, design students from the Eindhoven University of Technology developed the story of Pookie. Pookie is a pig in a petting zoo like a petting zoo in the middle of Johannesburg with three cows, three pigs, three chicken. Um, kids from primary schools go there, they pet them, they give them names, they feed them, and once in a while we poke them in the butt. And in a barn next to the petting zoo, we grow meat for the entire community. You can visit the barns on Sundays, and it's kind of like a microbrewery. Right? So then you have much more control over how your food is being produced than you currently have. So this is, this is the kind of storytelling that you may need for a lot of these technologies to, to become accepted. The last part is a little bit more complex, and that, that has to do with culture. And I'm going to take some time to, to tell you about a commercial that's currently running in, in the Netherlands. It's about barbecue sauce. And I kid you not, it's Sylvester Stallone um, with a machine gun killing half a dozen of people. Um, and there is this wimpy Dutch actor following in his trail. Um, and then after the set there is lunch and uh, Sylvester Stallone puts a big plate of steaks in front of this wimpy Dutch actor and he says, if you want to fight like a man, you have to eat like a man. And then the barbecue sauce comes in. <laughs> so it's a, cultural, it's a cultural concept, right? And it, so it has to do with, uh, with supremacy over other species. It has to do with masculinity, with fire, with um, power, all those things. And, and if you look into the history of meat, you can find that all back. And now we're going to make that in a factory. There's no risk involved. It's kind of a wimpy version of meat. You know, a hamburger becomes a piece of broccoli. It's like an intermediate product from a cultural perspective. So once you have accepted that this may happen, you can start to think about what else you can do with this. Can you actually make this a healthier product? So I told you we make these fat tissues. We can tell those fat cells without genetic modification just by feeding them to make omega-3 fatty acids so that that hamburger actually lowers your cholesterol. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, we can also be much more sort of uh, imaginative, you know, create by mixing stem cells from different species or using exotic species, which you have around here uh, galore, um, and think about different meats that we're currently not eating without endangering species. So I too have to present an um, exponential curve. <laughs> 
and, and this is our prediction of what the price is going to be when we launch this hopefully in about three years from now. So we have gone from $330,000, that quarter million euro, to about $11 um, for a hamburger, which is still a lot of money. It's basically way too expensive, um, but it's already marketable. And we know exactly where to um, fix the process to actually make this cheaper. And in fact, if you think about the efficiency of the system, 80% um, of meat, the price of meat, comes from the feed of the animals. And it's the same with cell culture. So if this is a system that is more efficient and you can convert those feed calories into uh, meat calories more efficiently, the price eventually has to come down. And we are working hard on uh, doing that. This is a technology that comes from the medical field and all the prices are somewhat artificial in this field. So up to um, two years ago, literally two years ago, we were the only ones in the world doing this. And at some point that starts to feel a little bit awkward. You know, am I, am I an idiot or is nobody else understanding this? And, and one of the most gratifying um, experiences, I think, in this whole process for the last couple of years has been that since two weeks, we now have 27 startup companies doing a version of this. Some for chicken, some for fish, some for milk, um, some for leather, um, and some for pork, and some for beef. So this is going to happen. There is a massive amount of money flowing into it. Uh, most of it, again, from Silicon Valley. Not only from angel investors, but also from large meat companies like Tyson and Cargill and Bell in Switzerland. Um, venture capitalists, uh, strategic investors. A lot of money is flowing into this area. Not only, by the way, um, cultured meat, if, so, uh, as I call it, but also in plant-based substitutes. So I think these technologies are all kind of potential solutions, and although they may feel somewhat awkward and we have to get used to the idea, um, we really have to make a choice. Do we want to keep doing this, knowing that it's an environmental threat, knowing that it's a very expensive part of our uh, meal? Do we want to keep doing this, or do we want to boil broccoli? <laughs> so, for me, the, the, the choice is pretty clear. Um, I would like to continue with uh, braai, although I call it something else. Um, and I hope after this I, I have somewhat convinced you that um, this could also be appetizing for you. So with that I would like to thank you and we have time left for questions. Thank you.